Commission Factory. Hey there, hustlers. Welcome back to the show. Today's episode is not the usual success story that we often hear on the show. It's fair to say that for most of our guests, their pivotal moment of growth that vaulted them to success was during COVID. Buoyed by customer demand and increased online spending, most brands with an e-com first strategy were able to ride the wave and vault them to the next stage of business. But my next guest, sadly, was the opposite. Juicy was founded in New Zealand in 2001 by Chris and Dan Alp, two brothers on a mission to make traveling and adventure accessible to everyone. Juicy is a car and camper van hire business, iconic for their fun green vans and very fun brand. But when COVID hit, the border shut down, our doors closed to the outside world, and the devastation to the tourism industry began. And that's where the next guest, Dave Simmons, comes in. The founders knew that they were in a unique situation and needed to think fast. So Dave was brought onto the business to make sense of their current situation, drive necessary organisational change, and help Juicy come through the other side. And that they did. Listen on for their unique story of transformation. Normally we have on the show a lot of founders and you are not a founder. So how about you introduce yourself and your background, where you've come from and what you're doing at Juicy? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. So yeah, you're right. I'm not a founder. <laughs> in the case of Juicy, I'm an, certainly an imposter. I think I'm the grey haired guy who's supposed <laughs> to add a bit of maturity perhaps to to the business. But to my, my background's travel and tourism largely in various marketplaces as well as outside of that. But help work with companies to help drive growth fundamentally, understanding the customer and then connecting distribution channels with those customers. I've got involved with Juicy nearly three years ago as the, the businesses had some challenges as we as had COVID, as did many tourism businesses, and got involved with some investors who put money in, had the opportunity to join this really super iconic tourism brand to help support a growth strategy or recovery and then growth strategy coming out the back of COVID. Let's talk about recovery. We've had a lot of brands on the show, a lot of retailers who stepped into COVID like everybody a little bit unsure, stepped out really well e-retailers, etc. We're going to be interviewing a couch company soon who absolutely killed it during COVID because everybody just wanted their comfy couches because what else are they doing? But you're in the travel industry and it really hurt. That's when you joined to help with the recovery. What was going on at the time? Yeah, so let me give you a bit of context for Michelle. You know, Juicy's 21 years old, the two brothers who founded the business, done an amazing job building a really strong, iconic brand. The business had been through growth year in, year out, which had enabled them to get involved in all sorts of new innovation. It expanded the business into America. We were, Juicy was involved in accommodation, had a cruise operation. So the brand had really grown massively and, and the momentum of growth had enabled them to get involved in all sorts of things. COVID COVID came along and literally overnight, the business came to a standstill. 95% of the business is international and cash flow stopped and that created some challenges. So it certainly put a huge weight on the business, let's yeah. say. And it was re- super, super painful. Lots of great people had to be let go from the business, huge amounts of uncertainty in terms of what that would look like. And ultimately, it needed to be recapitalized to drive growth out. What it provided was a really interesting opportunity to actually take a fresh look at how we wanted to grow back. As with any growth story, often you keep saying yes to things and you're not necessarily focused on process and you just kind of layer Mm. more people in to manage different processes. And whilst it's growing and the businesses make money, it, it actually doesn't matter that much. And it's only when things stop that actually a lot of that inefficiency and yeah, inefficiency both from a process perspective and from a cost of distribution perspective starts getting exposed. Mm-hmm. And so COVID really gave the business the opportunity to take a step back and go, how do we want to drive the business moving forward? And yeah, let's use this opportunity to reshape the platform, to position ourselves for really sustainable, profitable growth as we come out the other side. And what that involved was a number of things. It started, we started looking at how what our product is and how we distribute the product, how we price the product particularly. And pre-COVID, we had nine different price structures in place to cater for different channels and different markets, et cetera, et cetera. We said, listen, let's start by simplifying this. And so we simplified it right down to one price price point. We said, let's embrace technology and drive dynamic pricing. And that meant that actually for a lot of our distribution partners, our traditional distribution partners in Europe, they weren't able to work with us on that basis because they didn't have the ability to integrate our technology. They didn't have the ability to embrace dynamic pricing. But 
with the strength of the juicy brand, we said, let's do it anyway, because actually fundamentally, let's back ourselves that we can drive direct business if need be and work to drive that alongside the trade business and let's focus on that simplification and the efficiency. And so that then brought our focus back to going, okay, that's cool. How do we then drive that growth on the direct business and how do we do it in a really cost-effective, targeted way, which created the opportunity for us to look at affiliate marketing. It's a real measure of a business, I think, how they work through a time like that, isn't it? You know, it's all great when things are going successfully and you've got great success globally, but when the chips are down and there's no end in sight, COVID really, there was no end in sight. Travel restrictions really hurt. It's a real testament that you guys have come out the other side with kind of this kind of revamped product and I guess new look and feel and new way of working. What were some of the things that you implemented during that time that were maybe a little novel? Maybe the team were like, wait, what? What tech? How's that going to work? I know there's quite a few, right? You really had that time to think about the things that you could experiment on and try. Yeah. And listen, I can't stress enough how painful it was as a business. Mm. People, It was a long time. Like We kind of yeah. look back now and it feels like it all went by in a flash. But when you're in the middle of it and you didn't know when the end was, it was really tough for people that had been in the business for a long time to remain motivated and to see what a long term could look like. But to your point, like Juicy's are really, and it's always been built on innovation. It's always been built on energy and entrepreneurial spirit. And we were able to harness that a little bit and challenge ourselves to go, what do things look like? As one example, probably the biggest single change was this idea of embracing technology for distribution. And that might sound like an obvious thing, but actually in the travel industry, technology through distribution channels has been pretty clunky for a very long time. Almost 100% of our bookings that were sold through trade partners were touched by humans at some point in time. Travel partners in Denmark or Germany, they'd see a product on, on, a, on a website, on our, one of our websites, they'd see a rate, they'd email us overnight and to the call center and say, guys, can we make this booking for these dates at this rate? Someone in our call center would email them back and go, Gosh. actually, that vehicle's not available on those dates. Can You can do these dates. It sounds so inefficient. Yeah. And this was only three years ago. And this was not juicy. It was, it was across the industry. I thought that the industry must be far more advanced than that and centralized booking systems. and Still pretty clunky. And so what we said is, listen, we're going to go API first and foremost. We're going to move and going to work with distribution partners that are willing to integrate the API and book on either online through our online booking engine for, that we've developed for trade agents or mm. through the API. And we went from having 100% of our bookings being booked offline through trade partners to 97% of our bookings are now being booked through the API, mm. which is seismic from an wow. efficiency perspective. Yeah. You know, we're back doing similar sorts of volumes that we were doing pre-COVID, but with about a third of the staff mm. within a head office environment. And actually, it's a far better experience for our trade partners. It's a far better experience for their customers and everyone's winning. So yeah, that, that's been huge. And we did that with really limited development resource within head office, but just really good, innovative. In New Zealand, we have the saying, a sort of number eight wire mentality. It's let's just get it fixed and get it sorted. And we had a couple of guys who just rolled their sleeves up and worked really hard to ensure that technology platform was fit for purpose and could meet the needs of those travel partners in market that had embraced more of a digital kind of distribution ideology, let's say. So smart. What were some of the things you did away with? Apart from the clunky booking system, was there a moment where you went, you know what, obviously you're looking at the whole business and going, this is our time, this is our chance. So what else was there? that you kind of went, this has got to go. <laughs> Probably the biggest thing in there, Michelle, was the uh, dif differential rate structures. So mm. Having lots of different rates going to different travel agents and to different markets. We'd have a, let's say you might have that vehicle behind me there, for example, our, our Juicy Chaser. That product would be one price in Germany at one time of the year. It'd be a different price in Australia. It'd be a different price on our website. It'd be a different price mm. whether you book through a wholesaler in Germany versus a travel agent in Australia. So there's a huge amount of complexity that had been built up over time. And probably the biggest single thing we did was just rip that all up and say, we're going to have mm. one rate. It's a dynamic rate. If we've got it on our website, you can have it as a trade partner through your website, but you have to book it online. So those two key things were really fundamental around simplifying the rate structure and then really driving this idea of digital first and API first. And that, that's really been a big game changer for us, for sure. Mm, that simplification changes so much in terms of resources of structure and the simplification, I should say, for the customers as well.
as well. Without doubt. And probably one of the biggest challenges as we went through that, Michelle, is A, having confidence in the brand and the strategy, mm. but also having the discipline to say no. And that's super, super hard in any growth environment. Like we had a lot of old historical partners who came to us and said, you're only kidding about this kind of API thing, aren't you? You are going to enable us to book offline again. It's like, nope. And they go, you'll change your mind, surely. No. It's like, nope. <laughs> and some of the, saying no was really hard mm. because some of these partners had been giving us a big seven-figure sums of business pre-COVID. And we were like going, no, it's not how we want to build back. So having that confidence in the strategy and the real kind of belief that it had the ability to deliver for us then gave us a confidence and discipline to say no. So that, you know, those was, that was probably for me the really – and getting the – I had 100% confidence we could deliver it, but getting confidence around the business to join us on that journey, mm. that was an interesting kind of exercise. But yeah, to the point where in, in Berlin last week, we were sitting down with some very large distribution channels, let's say, who were some of these guys saying, you'll change your mind. And they now know that we're not. Mm. And we're now actually saying to them, it's you guys that now need to change. And if you don't, then you're probably staring at another Kodak moment, perhaps. But, yes. Yeah, so a lot of fun in that regard. The Flex Your Hustle podcast is made possible by the team at Commission Factory. Commission Factory is the largest performance and partner marketing network in Asia Pacific, powering tens of thousands of meaningful and scalable partnerships. If you're listening to this show, you might be looking for ways to find and activate successful connections that drive revenue for your business. Well, Commission Factory works with everyone from e-commerce brands to influencers, big digital editorial titles and cashback communities, right through to the latest apps and software that help customers convert and they aggregate all those partnerships in the one place. You'll love how easy that makes managing it. If you're tired of paying for clicks and impressions, Commission Factory is a pay-on-performance marketing platform where you pay only when tangible sales are generated, not just eyes on the page, so it's low risk and easy to manage your bottom line. So to all you digital publishers, influencers, online retailer and marketing agency folks out there, come see what Commission Factory can do for you. Visit commissionfactory.com where infinite partnerships are simply enabled. I have to dig in. You said that the kind of internal education and getting people on board was challenging. I have no doubt. Organisational change, whether you're moving to a data-driven organisation, a tech-driven organisation from one that feels a little bit more, dare I say, analogue, can be challenging. There's people who don't get it, don't understand it, can't see the value. People get scared that they might lose their jobs. And in this case, maybe some people did. What was that like and how is it today? Yeah, really interesting question, Michelle. And this was a really unusual situation because when I came into the business, it almost been like a nuclear bomb had been dropped of it, on it. Like A lot of people had been made redundant. People in the organization that didn't have any reporting lines because their boss had been made redundant and their boss's boss had been made oh, redundant. Dear. So there was an element of shell shock, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but again, there was this real kind of commitment to want to bring the business back stronger. And whilst there wasn't any international trade, it was really easy to make these changes changes and, and get alignment about it. Everyone wanted internally to work simpler because we didn't have the people to actually do some of the clunky processes. So actually simplifying the processes was almost a matter of need to fit in with the amount of limited resources. Mm. Because business wasn't coming back strongly, we couldn't bring back people anyway. So there was a natural constraint that enabled us to embed that change. I think there was probably always a question mark around whether we could hold that line as borders reopened and we started looking to reach out to our international partner and say no to some of those guys. But what I think we'd seen in the meantime was a real growth from some of our more digital orientated partners who'd filled the gap anyway mm. that had been left by the bigger analog partners, to use your phrase. And we'd also had huge success in growing our direct business in a really cost-effective and controlled way, which had also given us that confidence, if you like, to stay focused on the road ahead. Yeah, it's like simplicity for necessity's sake. And if there's no other option and this is how you have to operate moving forward, I guess it does make it a lot easier. It was the ultimate burning platform. It's in many ways, it was, it was far easier to drive change with those circumstances mm. versus a large established business that's going well and trying to drive change mm. within that. It's certainly a lot harder. Glad to hear you guys are doing well today. And obviously you pulled through that period. A lot of other travel companies obviously didn't. So a real testament to you guys just knuckling down and think, okay, how do we just 
do this? How do we figure this out? You've obviously made a lot of changes from a booking perspective, from a customer experience perspective, but I know a really big thing that you brought into the business as well was affiliate marketing and in general performance marketing and how do we get smarter about the dollars that we're using. I know this is your passion place, so I wanted to get the business conversation down first and now let's talk about performance marketing side. Without doubt, affiliate marketing has been a huge part of our sort of recovery strategy. My journey with affiliate marketing goes back probably 25 years in the UK and some of those early affiliate platforms started coming into the travel market and they were very quickly embraced and obviously in the northern hemisphere in those markets you've got big scale. I then moved back to New Zealand 10, 15 years ago and was involved with a national carrier based in New Zealand, let's say. And at that time, we started looking at exploring affiliate marketing, but there just wasn't, frankly, there weren't really any sort of maturity or scale in the market in this, in this part of the world. And I'd lost touch with it a little bit. And when I joined Juicy, we just started having conversations with Commission Factory at that point in time. And it was like, holy smoke, this is great. We There is now a matured kind of environment mm. that we can grab hold of. And so we embraced it with a view of really treating it as a distribution channel as opposed to a marketing channel. The thing I love about affiliate marketing is it's, for us in the travel sector, it's a straight commission-based model, which is very consistent with our traditional trade channels, let's say. And when you start treating affiliate in that way, in that same sort of mindset, then it just it's an open-ended kind of pathway. And so that's how we embedded it. We brought it into the business initially in December 2020, I think it was. And it was a big learning curve. It was a really steep learning curve in terms of going to Okay, so we've got it in here. How do we now optimize it? To that point, we actually brought in some external support, a dedicated agency based stateside, actually, that we'd happen to run across, who were really awesome in terms of helping us accelerate our growth real quick and betting it the whole kind of strategy of affiliate into the business on our side as well as helping to leverage into wider networks but you know, again it was it took us six months to start really getting some momentum as you'd expect i yep. guess with any kind of program but then as soon as we'd started getting a couple of things in place it really took off and the ability for us to treat it as a cost of sale and embed it as a cost of sale above the line if you like just changed the mindset forever and it took a little while to get the finance guys to understand that it was okay to put this marketing thing through as an above the line cost of sale and to treat it in the same way we'd treat a travel agent and then once we got that in place and man we haven't looked back and it's now without doubt our single largest source of traffic from a or business turnover from a uh, distribution channel perspective. You just said something so interesting there that I sometimes raise this with different business owners and they never think of affiliate as a cost of sale. They always think about it in their marketing mix. And yes, it operates in a very similar way of marketing. There's messaging, there's brand, there's like your positioning, etc., partnership, but it's only coming off your bottom line. So it is a cost of goods sold and therefore should be treated differently in a different budget. How did you do that? So for the people listening, if they have to go through that same conversation with their finance team, what's the trick? <laughs> Apart from bullying the finance people to <laughs> just do it. <laughs> oh, listen, I think it's just understanding the model in terms of, for us, it's a straight commission based model. There's a variality, of, a sort of variable component to it, obviously, based upon the various publishing platforms that we hook into. But fundamentally, it's a straight commission that I can forecast on a fairly accurate basis on a monthly play in terms of what that percentage is going to be. So long as you can have real confidence about the attribution, which clearly platforms commission factory enable you to get really tight on attribution anyway then Ben will say hey listen here's a direct cost a variable cost associated with this transaction therefore it's highly justifiable to put it above the line in that cost of sale it's a you no-brainer a conversation yeah absolutely and without any shadow of a doubt at all if you treat it as a marketing expense you're probably only going to get 20 30 percent of the value out of affiliate yeah. activity there's no question in my mind if we treated this like an affiliate as a marketing cost and go this month we're going to spend five thousand dollars on it why would we cap it if we're still selling like yeah the, as say we wouldn't do it with a travel agent or an online travel agent if they're selling and we're paying them more commission we're going hey fantastic these guys have had a record month and we've paid them more money 
embrace the same thought process for affiliate. Treat it like a distribution channel. Celebrate when revenue's coming in, and if that means you're paying a little bit more, great. But it's it's a whole lot more cost effective than a lot of other performance marketing environments where there's a lot more variability and you're less control over that cost of sale. And to your point as well, like you said, it does take time. There's a there's learning that is involved with affiliate marketing. And if you do cap it, you say, oh, I'll only dip my toe in the water every month with a certain small budget. You're not really, you're limiting yourself, really. You're not allowing yourself to test and learn and try new things. 100%. And there's no downside in testing. Right? Like, there's mm. not like there's heavy fixed costs associated with putting any new program in. It's all a variable cost. So there's no downside of having it uncapped because you're only going to pay more if you've got more revenue coming through. Yep. I would love to have a conversation with the CFO if, if they said no to that in terms of, yeah, go to, do we want to grow the business and drive the sales here or not? It could be, to your point, maybe a lack of understanding of just how far and wide affiliate marketing goes. And you mentioned something earlier, which was so healthy and so smart in terms of it's just a channel with untapped ability and you need to think of it, the transactional aspect rather than the things that go in and the things that people constantly think of first when they think of affiliate marketing, like influencer marketing or rewards or cashback. So why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the areas in which you're leveraging affiliate marketing? Because I know you guys really have tapped that for all the great resources and tech that you can. Yeah, and it's still a journey of discovery. I keep being amazed. I like to think I know a little bit about the environment, but I keep getting amazed at new partners that come to the surface that keep bringing new things to the table. Mm. We start in a very traditional sense in terms of looking at platforms that could deliver eyeballs that were aligned with our kind of notion of kind of our target customer. Um, And there was certainly a pile of environments, platforms that we partnered with that none of us actually knew who they were, but we were recommended to do it. And sure enough, they started driving volume into us. And you go, hey, that's cool. And subsequently learned more about it. So in the first instance, used in a very traditional sense. And then as we started exploring further opportunities, and again, working really closely in partnership with our advisory guys, yeah, they started actually bringing other ideas to the table around on-site optimization technology. And that was just a massive eye-opener for me. Mm. Never really thought about technology solutions being delivered through an affiliate framework. And it was just a massive sort of light bulb moment where we went, do you know what? There's a pile of things in here that we'd love to trial, but we just don't have the bandwidth within our technology environment or indeed traditional SaaS models where you'd pay a subscription fee to get access to some of that technology. And as a result, we hadn't been doing them. And then we started discovering these things through the affiliate environment, chatbot being a really interesting one. We had a traditional kind of SaaS-based live chat model on the site. That particular technology provider was trying to upsell us to additional functionality on that. And then we discovered a solution through Commission Factory that said, hey, listen, we'll develop a chatbot for you and be focused purely on helping you drive sales and we'll pay you a commission of sale, uh, charge you a commission based upon sales generated off the chatbot as the last point of contact on the on-site journey. And it was almost like there was nothing to lose. In fact, there wasn't anything to lose. So we went, yeah, let's give it a go. And it just took off. And this is an environment, this is a time when we had really limited cash flows, borders were still closed, we didn't have a lot of resource internally. And within the space of about three months, this chatbot that we put onto the site became a massive contributor of revenue. And it was something that we'd never have been able to do if we were looking at it through a traditional lens of, let's go and do an evaluation of different SaaS platforms and let's Mm. develop tools internally and let's justify a monthly budget of whatever to support a chatbot. This just changed the whole game in terms of there is no downside. The partner's going to do the setup and we can learn. And so much so, it was such, it was a massive success for us within a fairly short space of time. And then there were other sort of tools like on-site optimization where, again, if we had more bandwidth within the dev team, we might have done some of the things internally, but there were bigger issues that we had to have the limited tech resource that we had internally, we needed to have them focused on. So the ability to bring site exit carts and a number of other little triggers that we were able to play with to drive optimization on site was just awesome. Like, uh, and again, we gathered heaps of learnings from that. As we've worked with more of these partners, they've begun you know, been able to bring more things to the table as well. So we've used it both in terms of bringing traffic into the business as well as helping us to off- optimize the traffic that we get onto the platform. And again, all the while on a variable cost basis. So it's been it's a super exciting environment to be involved with. Incredible to hear just how one relationship as well can really stretch the gamut 
pivot of your business. It's not just about marketing and the pool of customers. It's about that conversion as well. And there's so many tools and technology out there that, you know, these affiliate marketing companies like Commission Factory work with that can really help accelerate that conversion because that's what they're focused on. They're focused on sales. They're focused on conversion. Like, how do we get these customers in? How do we convert? That's the only way that the businesses make money. So it makes sense to be leaning into that and just going, well, let's try it. There's no real risk. There's probably a bit of work involved, but also if it doesn't work, we can try something else. But, you know, these guys, if they're so focused on making those conversions happen because that's their remuneration model, it makes sense because you're all in the game together. Without doubt. And I think there's a real internal benefit or cultural kind of benefit from embedding that affiliate thinking, if you like, and again, that cost of sale thinking into the business. There's no doubt that people within the Juicy team have benefited enormously from engaging with some of the various partners that we've brought on and the real sharpness that they've brought around conversion and optimization, which because that's what they live and breathe and their whole revenue models are based upon that, there's a real sharpness to the thinking that you don't often get, let's say, from internal teams. So that exposure to that those sort of engagements has definitely helped bring a real edge to other work that we do across the business, particularly in other performance marketing areas, bringing a real sharpness and edge to how we critique what we're doing in paid search or SEO or social, for example, that's definitely you know, flowed back from what we've been doing in the affiliate space. No, no question about that. From an affiliate marketing perspective, how does that fit into your marketing teams or your agency structures? How does it all work, even from a reporting perspective? So it's a really tough one, to be honest, Michelle, because there's just not people in the market who understand affiliate marketing. Yeah, we've had some really good internal resources that's been really keen to learn, and they did a great job. I think we've supported them really well. They've been out to various conferences internationally and affiliate conferences to learn more about opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So we've been through a bit of an upskilling process internally. Our existing marketing agencies, again, they've been learning from what we've been doing. I love that. <laughs> and that's why we actually found some specialist resource based out of the US that worked has worked with us for the last two, two and a half years and have become a really tight strategic partner to help us optimize and to accelerate those learnings fundamentally in the affiliate space. So that was certainly probably a big reminder or a learning, if you like, for me was going, actually, the maturity of affiliate marketing in this part of the world, certainly New Zealand, probably a little further ahead in Australia, we just don't have the capability and the knowledge. And so as a result, those sort of conversations about positioning it as cost of sale versus marketing budget, there's not the maturity and the confidence to actually understand what those conversations look like and the potential of it. It's it's something that we're confronting at the moment in terms of if we want to continue to really ramp this up to another level, how do we actually get resource internally to help drive that further? Do we need to look offshore to recruit people with that specialist knowledge? Because there's not a big market of, of affiliate marketers in New Zealand looking for jobs at the moment. Be fair to say. I worked in the States for a while and the affiliate marketing, like you said, is much more mature over there. I was working in a digital performance marketing agency and it was always part of the mix. There was a separate team. There was without a doubt, no question that affiliate marketing was part of brand success story where I do think here there's maybe still trepidation or I just think people are unclear and what they don't quite understand, they're hesitant to step into or they step into the things that are familiar, coupons and things like that, which there's so much more to affiliate marketing and so much more to be leveraged so we need young people getting excited about it so they start becoming the experts and leading the next generation of really smart marketing leaders to to really embrace it because every business needs to grow and if you're only paying on a sale it's just a no-brainer honestly. Couldn't agree more, Michelle. And if you talk to marketing managers, everyone knows the phrase affiliate Mm. marketing but if you then scratch behind that and go, so talk me through some of the various platforms and the opportunities. You get these blank Mm. looks on your face. It's kind of like, uh, yeah, maybe not. That is without doubt the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity for affiliate marketing platforms like Commission Factory to actually build an awareness and an understanding of the opportunity. And it's got to start with the young marketers coming through and making it part of the normal Mm. kind of conversation. Certainly, I like that thinking that you say around thinking about it in the context of how it's run, how it's measured from a COGS perspective 
yeah. really thinking about it more as the platform itself and not all the different places we can be in, not influencer marketing, not publisher marketing, et cetera, but just thinking about it as a new way of running business and what are all the things within our business, be it our customer experience, our website, where affiliate marketing can really impact the business. So it's a refreshing way of looking at it and definitely something I think that most businesses need to be looking at in the future. The one thing you've got to promise me is that you don't share this with any of our competitors because I'd hate for them to learn the secret of how awesome uh, affiliate marketing is. Too late. <laughs> it's in the can. It's free. We're going to send it everywhere. No, I mean, look, they probably will listen. Will they have the speed and the tenacity like you guys did? You obviously really knuckled down and you really embrace change and it doesn't matter how many good ideas you have on the table, That it's the mindset. I'm really happy to hear you guys are doing well and what a tremendous change and a tremendous story. We're really, really, uh, I guess, in a privileged position to have such a strong, iconic brand. You know, yes. Juicy's such a strong, iconic brand in, so in iconic. the motorhome camp event space. So the ability to leverage that and particularly with the audience that it reaches and connects into has certainly given us a really strong platform to deliver good outcomes in this space for sure. All I have to say is the green van and everyone should get a visual in their head of, oh, I know those guys, the green van guys. Yes, they're the green van guys. Yeah, very awesome iconic brand. Van. I'm going to plan my New Zealand road trip soon. It's going to be juicy or nothing because there's no way I can get shots of my car that I hire and it's with beautiful New Zealand backdrop and not have a juicy van. It's just iconic. That would be an absolute disgrace, Michelle, but I know someone who can probably help you. How is the business going today? It's been amazing. We've had a huge summer season. We've welcomed back yeah, thousands of international guests into Australia and New Zealand. We've had record months in terms of trading. Yeah, even from sort of October, November, we were experiencing kind of record sales and pickups and it certainly created some challenges for our operational guys, no doubt about that. Kept them on their toes, but it's just neat to be in a position where we can welcome international visitors back and and enable them to explore uh, all things that are awesome about Australia and New Zealand. Your yeah, business is in really good shape at the moment and yeah, we've got a great platform now to continue to drive robust, sustainable, profitable growth as we move forward. I'm really happy to hear it. Onwards and upwards to a great tourism season next year as well. Absolutely. Dave, thank you so much. Appreciate your openness and sharing all that great info and inspiration. Great to have the opportunity to chat with you, Michelle, and anything to help spread the word of the joys of affiliate marketing. We have another exciting episode coming up. Here's a sneak peek. We're really fortunate that we've got two people who can understand the commercial side of the business, obviously translate that into our performance media. And then quite frankly, the rarest part of that skill set and the one that both of them have is being able to communicate that back to the non-digital marketers within the business. If you aren't already, don't forget to follow so you don't miss an app. And while you're there, why not drop us a rating and review? We'd love to hear what you think. Flex Your Hustle is made possible by the great team at Commission Factory and produced by Ample. I'm Michelle Lomas. Keep hustling and bye for now. Commission Factory.